Another little comment on Miriam was that basically Miriam Smith, she uh, is a wonderful artist, and you'll see her work displayed at the White River Gallery periodically, etc. In the past. She dropped on my leg. Oh, okay. She's dropped out. I forgot to tell you, I'm back here. I can't see any of your faces. So if you know me, come and say hello. Okay. Miriam, thank you. Um, also, I'd like the name Marquat is also a, a White River Township name, and. Uh, her sister, for instance, is Helen Chase, correct? Yes. Helen and Bill Chase, wonderful, wonderful people, and uh, Helen died recently, but uh, remarkable people. And uh, um, They produced the Chase's calendar of annual events, used by all. Right, the Chase's calendar, right. Libraries all across the United States. I used to teach out of it. <laughs> okay, next up uh, we'll do, uh, thank you, Miriam. Um, We'll go with Blanche Mason. Here we go. Okay, I'm Blanche Mason. I'm a, uh, practically a native of Whitehall. I guess I moved here when I was about a year old. And uh, I was almost a tail end of the family until my folks decided they would need a native Whitehall person, and my little sister was born. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my chagrin, but I was happy that over the years that she was my best friend, and I'm sorry she's gone. Uh, that's Dolly, right? Yes. And I'm the last of my seven brothers and sisters. I'm at home, south seven brothers and sisters. Uh, I chose part of my neighborhood that I knew back before we started naming streets, putting street signs up. And I thought I'd take a trip up Watkins Road, circa 1930. Uh, we started US 31 down Whitehall Road. That was the old 31. And I don't know if the Florence and Road was ever US 31, but it was the way to Muskegon way back when. Uh, the first property listed, uh, oh, they wrote maybe graveled in the country and came toward town. Uh, the property listed in an old plant book belonged to Eva Zatsky Norris. Leslie Norris, evidently deceased, had a shingle mill. Eva Norris Whittle was my junior high teacher. The schools hired only single or widowed women on the policy and only amended during World War II when most men were grafted. Many teachers I had as single women were back to teaching and my kids had a couple. Eva was one of the four Angel sisters, dad owning the local meat market. This family, I believe, should be a product for this society as they have been an integral part of this city. We've done lots of things in this city. And I have we have uh, Joyce Scott, Lee, Lee Hain, and uh, Rex Funnel is not here, but they're all products from these wonderful women. Uh, going up the road, you come next to Harry Nelson Farm, and all the property on the south side is now the Hickory Knoll Golf Course. All that remains on that north side is a yellow house, and I'm assuming it was the family house of the family hired to help run the farm. We always had some hired families to run, to do the farm work that they couldn't do themselves if you didn't have a big enough family. <laughs> like a lot of the modern farmers have huge families. Uh, the next farm belonged to Fred Watkins, and I have an article from the Skeeton Chronicle dated 1950, written by the countrywide famed, countywide famed Nellie B. Chisholm. So I have a quick little thing from the paper. There was a picture also of old Fred. Uh, Fred Watkins was born in Whitehall, August 1864, has the distinction of living ever since on that same farm. His parent, parents, Jacob and Hannah Watkins, were born in Wales, and soon their marriage came to Whitehall. Soon after their marriage, they came to Whitehall and took a squatter's claim on his farm. With the help of an escaped slave, they built the ball cabin, later replaced by a fine farmhouse in which Fred and his family lived. Many houses were built with lumber that was salvaged when a lumber ship dumped its load into White Lake. In case of illness, someone went on horseback to Muskegon for the doctor, and who would arrive several days later. <laughs> uh, during game were plentiful, so no one went without meat. For many years, Mr. Watkins was associated with H.S. Anderson Packing Company in, in Muskegon in the cattle buying business and later was an agent for Cohen Roden Canning Company in Grand Rapids. In 1950, he was still living on that farm. His son, John, was an attorney 
in Indianapolis and Stella, who remained in the family home after her parents' death. The property was sold and the house was torn down and replaced by a new one. My dad and Fred had an ongoing association. I'm a little farm girl living in the city. <laughs> Our farm was in the city. Uh, we had four or five cows and he had a bull. When the cow went dry, my dad would walk the cow over to spend the overnight with Fred's good bull. <laughs> if the result of this tryst was a heifer, we kept it. If it wasn't, it soon graced our dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> Women slept. Um, with, with, with Fred's association with the meatpacking company and Grand Rapids Tannery, I'm assuming that the cow found too old to reproduce would be delivered to Fred. Across the road from the Watkins was a large farm situated on a gully that was owned by Madison, Madison, and a fence divided our property from theirs. The barn held the milk cows that were part of Sump's business as a local dairy. That barn was on what Jacob's family moved into, uh, not the barn, but they built the property they bought. Uh, so we held uh, Sump's business was as, as a local dairy. The coolie shed and bottling outfit were further up the road by the water tower, along with the family home. They supplied milk door to door from a wagon and from a sledge in winter replete with sleigh bells along with the clinket bottles. The Zumps were originally from Austria and my mom would be a frequent caller on Mrs. Zump. The ladies would do their visiting in German as my mother was fluent and had to learn German as a presence in Vienna. I'm a first generation of American, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, on the south side stands a white house at the end of Peach Street that is owned by Perry Holden, who has who had a large white house, now red, a bit further up the road. The smaller house was a tenant farmer's house, and our mailboxes were RFD number one, a good, a good distance from our house. Um, this, um, uh, Professor Holden, I gotta get my ducks in a row here, I had many fruit trees, so mom and us kids would pick fruit in season for canning. My memories was of a man who would admonish us not to break any limbs, making him kind of scary, tall, thin man with a white goatee. This gentleman was a pioneer in farming education circles in the Midwest. I googled his name and found a couple of laudatory articles about him. The farm was his, was his retirement place. So I'll read this little piece I got from the internet. Uh, P.G. Holden was born in Dodge Center, Minnesota, studied at the Michigan State University. At that time, it was the Michigan Agricultural College. And he was awarded MS in 1895. Subsequently, he went to the University of Illinois at Urbana and Champaign, where he became an assistant professor for soil physics and the first professor of agronomy got to get that right, of the U.S. from 1896 until 1900. For the next two years, he served as manager of Funk Brothers Seed Company, promoting the use of hybrid corn seeds. In 1902, he joined the Iowa State University, first as vice dean of agriculture, and then of 1906 was head of the ISU Extension Service. Through his various outreach programs to promote the use of hybrid corn seeds, he became known as the corn evangelist. He also was instrumental in solving the, the bull weevil, bull weevil problem down south with cotton. Uh, he ran for governor of Iowa in the Republican primary. After his defeat, he moved to Michigan again, where he became director of International Harvesters Agriculture Extension Department. He retired in 1932. He was married to Carrie Ann and Amelia Burnett. They had four children. One of them died as an infant. And I was also aware, or have been thinking, known all, quite a few years now, that uh, the communists, way back when, in Russia, had a five-year uh, agriculture program. And I have ever heard a story that uh, Professor Holden was the one that uh, devised that program. I don't know how well they did, but... And he was nice, though. The next house down the street belonged to C. O. Morgan. And all I know about him is that he had two children, Walter and Evelyn Meekle, who raised her family in that house. 
We come to what is known as Warner and Alice, and on the northeast corner is another old house. When I was in school, it was owned by the Malackers with two daughters around my age. The place is now owned by Rodney Olson, who has an eye, has an eye popping vegetable and flower garden. I'm going to buy her greatly. Across the Warner was the chicken farm for Chris Taub. Halt, another German immigrant. That raised a big family. A school bought the property, built the football field, and what used to be the new high school. One of their sons died in World War II. Now, south along Alice Tree were trees and a gully all the way to Division. The north side was where the school was situated with some private ownership, no, no buildings. On the corner of Alice and Division stands the Van Curen House that is presently occupied by Mayor Mac Hatch. Hatch. Mac Hatch. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was part of the Ruggles group of houses on Division. The Van der Purens owned a part of the farm we bought, so we, on occasion I would walk over with my mom to make a mortgage payment. The friendship between Mrs. Van Curen resulted in a naming of my last sibling after Adele Van Curen. Kitty Corner was from there was a Gibbs house. The house was torn down recently, but the little red house remains and is in the home of Tanya Cabal, our councilman who can claim the Gibbs as kin. The Gibbs own most of the block back to Lincoln Street and the house there belongs to Walters and Potter. I went to school with a couple of the Gibbs clan. On the corner of Mears and Alice was an Eastern's auto dealership run by Oliver and Harry. We bought a car from them around that time. Having no cars to sell during World War II, they rented a part of the building to the U.S. Racing Board. In 1943, I was employed there until they closed the office and moved it to Muskegon. I rode the bicycle to work every day. It's a nice and handy. I couldn't do that when we moved to Muskegon. <laughs> so on the other corner was the Moog House. The first Moog is listed as having a furniture store. Uh, the last Moog was Ferris, who was in school with my older siblings. The house was torn down and a lot vacant for a few years, and there now is a new house on that spot. My Watkins Road is now paved end to end, and they call it Alice Street after Mr. Gwynn, our city manager, managed me to put up all the street signs. Uh, the newer homes, there are many, many, many newer homes that are filled in all the empty spaces, so it's an interesting street, it's a busy street. So I was raised in the country, and my kids were raised on the same property I was, they were city kids, so. <laughs> and what else can I say? I guess that's enough, thank you. <laughs>